Your Excellency, it's wonderful to have you on CNBC. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd love it if you would just take a step back and set the scene for us in a educated adult and frankly um, real politic manner about what's happening right now in the market that perhaps people at home in the United States and in Europe don't really understand because the President of the United States and other leaders, including Mr. Zelensky, are saying to petrol rich economies, fix this problem for us. If you just would flood the market with some oil and gas, then perhaps Vladimir Putin would frankly decide um, to take another course in Ukraine. Walk us through what's actually happening in the market. Uh, well, first of all, it's great to be with you. And uh, I think what's, com what's, what's happening is sad and complicated at the same time. Uh, the, uh, any conflict, whoever is uh, right or wrong, doesn't matter. What's the reality is people are dying from both sides and we need to stop this. And there are many countries uh, trying to help uh, trying to mediate the talk, trying to give incentive to both parties to find the resolution, compromise if it has to be, but stop uh, the, uh, the, uh, the conflict and, uh, and go back to normal life. What happened was a shock to the market. As you know and you're following, uh, we've been struggling within OPEC Plus to, uh, to bring more investments. The whole world six months ago told us you're not invited to COP26 and... And you're not welcome. And you're not welcomed and you are bad. Uh, the producers are all uh, doing something nasty to the environment and we need no investments. And we've been warning about this. Uh, I've been with you for how many, how many sessions and I've been saying again the same. Again and again. And I've been saying it. We need to pour more investment. We need to bring incentivized investors. So they, what happened... Uh, during all of that talk, many of the IOCs were going for renewable energy, which is a good thing, yes. but they are, they are doing less investments in the oil and gas. And we lost within OPEC Plus around a more than a million barrel uh, just a month ago uh, of a production that they cannot bring because I cannot believe that a country can bring a barrel and when the price is 100 plus and they're not bringing it. So those countries cannot make those numbers, their numbers, that they used to produce last year. Yeah. Which is alarming that where are we going to go in the next, in the next uh, six months or, 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 uh, or so when we end? God knows what is going to be the conformity levels. Talking about what will happen when we need more energy, as we will inevitably, and whether or not OPEC countries are going to be able to fill that gap. Yeah. There's always a deep concern about that. OPEC plus alone cannot do it. We need the, the other producers to, the, to, their, to do their part. But the problem is when the investors are not encouraged and when the shareholders of the IOCs and some countries are banding uh, the, the investments, then they should not blame it on us. Yeah. They should come and change, put a strategy. Uh, plus, who can replace Russia today? I cannot think of a country that can, in a year, two, three, four, even ten years, yeah. replace a ten million barrels. It's so just not realistic, is what you're it's saying. It's not realistic to people and who understand the market and deal with the fundamentals every day. It's not realistic, and this talk is only going to push the prices higher. They know it's not going; to, it's not possible. So, if someone is saying we're going to put more pressure, we squeeze the barrels, they're not going to be squeezed. They will go to Amar to, to another market, another buyer, who would like the discount, and we will end up in a situation where the prices are even higher, okay. and that is that is hurting the economies. We care about the consuming nations, and we care about the consumers wherever they are. This is a relationship that we established, and would like to have it for long. We cannot just be reactive in this in this file and say we will put more oil in the market when the market is well supplied. So we will meet end of the of this of this uh, end of this week and uh, by end of the month and we will look what can we do. But always Russia is going to be part of that group and we need to respect them and we need when we go there and talk we need to talk technical 
and we need to talk sense and we need to speak on behalf of the consuming nations and the consumers that we give them what they require. When you think about this with regards to what we heard from Yusuf Ateba, the ambassador to the United States, not too long ago, maybe a couple of weeks, he essentially said that the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, would not be opposed to putting more oil on the market. And you clarified seemingly that statement by saying, listen, we're about stabilizing the market. We're about doing what it is that we can to make sure that the prices remain stable. What is a stable price in the current environment? Because at this point, we've seen oil hitting above 130. We've seen it sinking below 100. What in your mind, and I know you don't speak price specifically, but what can we expect in your view, given the volatility? And given the fact that it seems as if nobody really knows what the answer is. Well, price is a result of a supply and demand balance and the inventories. So if someone would like to push certain barrels that are in the market and available, doesn't want to take them and want an alternative, and that alternative is not there, the market will, will uh, the, the price will increase. And that's, that's, it. that's what happened. It's not the fact that those barrels, and when you make it more complicated with, with removing uh, the Russia from SWIFT, or uh, should we or should we not, and what does that apply to all of that, of that unplanned, reactive uh, actions made the market where it is today. Yeah. So I think the market need, need us to be calm. We need to be looking at the numbers, looking at the supply and demand, try to balance it. And another factor, Iran is coming or not coming, we don't know. And Iran is a member. And once they come, they will have their production. So we have no clarity on uh, when uh, this deal is happening, if it is happening, and how much is coming. Yeah. So that is another factor that it needs to be, from a numbers point of view, supply and demand numbers need to be plugged in. Yeah. Because Iran would have the right to come and bring their barrels into the market. You know, there's an argument that obviously OPEC plus, you're speaking to Mr. Novak, you're speaking directly in that sense to Russia, to the Kremlin. So you have perhaps a better insight than those who are not involved in those conversations. And I'm talking about the folks at the White House. I'm talking about the folks in Europe who are suffering from the, the biggest energy crisis that Europe have, has faced. Uh, it's certainly in the 20th and even now in the 21st century. When you think about this a bit more broadly, is it a mistake in your view that the United States is not speaking, whether on the record or off the record, to OPEC on a more regular basis and well, engaging? Well, you know how it is. It's illegal. They perceive it as illegal to talk to us. But we know that in the past administrations, there was always a dialogue. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that was constructive when they spoke with us. But today, we need to be practical. OPEC plus, when they speak to us, they need to speak to us, including Russia. Yeah. And that could be an obstacle today. But beside the point, we don't want the prices to go higher. We are in agreement with their, their target or, or their objective of trying to calm the market and balance the market. But you don't do it this way. The mean is wrong. You don't do it by, by putting sanctions on hydrocarbon that you cannot replace unless you want the prices to go high. So they are doing something but expecting the opposite reaction and it's not going to happen. Yeah. So we, are, we cannot agree with them in putting or considering that option because that will hurt the consumers, that will hurt those uh, consumers in the United States or whoever, in the gasoline prices and everything is, is going to increase if we do what they are, what some are asking us to do. That's why we are always going to be logical, objective, and we will do the right thing from a technical point of view not from the emotional point of view and the political point of view. That, there is another department, another ministry taking care of that. My job as a professional in this field is to ensure that as a collective group, we are doing something that serves the consuming nations. We're doing some things that calm the, the, the prices, but we should not do it as a reactive. We should do it based on calculations and without squeezing anyone out of the market. But you know, I'm 
as a professional, incredibly passionate about my job, and I know that you, as a father and as a minister, are deeply passionate about what you do and making sure that you get it right, not just for the folks here in the UAE, but more globally. And I've seen that in your time as a minister of energy and a minister in, within the OPEC agreement. Are you not worried that the UAE stands in danger of being on the wrong side of history here as the Russians slaughter Ukrainians? To the opposite, I think what we are doing, incentivizing talk to end it, is going to be much better as an action than pouring weapons to the Ukrainians and they are not, they are going to die. If that, if we, if we want them to die, we should encourage them to go and kill each other. I think we need to end this. And, and, and as a father, I care about those families that are misplaced, displaced from their, their homes, and the war is ugly. We've seen it, we've seen it in Iraq, and we have seen it in Syria, we have seen it in, in Afghanistan. The war is ugly. And in, during war, casualties are, and families are losing. Casualties are the, the, the price of war. So this war, this conflict, if, if enough efforts internationally are put in the, into the diplomacy, like many countries are now doing, even some NATO members like Turkey and others, they are, they prefer to go, to go and encourage, talking to both and trying to encourage the, the, the diplomatic talk. And, and I think, and I, am, I have hope that if we are all serious about that, it's gonna happen. But if someone is saying, no, we will give more weapons and we will give, give you, it's like giving, pouring uh, fuel into a fire. We need to distinguish the fire, not to pour fuel in it. That's my personal view, again, uh, and, uh, and I think I, uh, I would rather to stay within my remits yes. in, uh, in, in the oil and gas. I care as a father as well about those families that are going to not be able to put food on the table because of the higher prices. Wheat is going, is going to skyrocket uh, percentages and uh, soya bean and others and corn and others. So we need to be sensible yeah. and ask ourselves how many millions, if we continue, uh, how many millions of people will be dying from poverty? So supporting outside. Ukraine in that sense, that the West is doing this, could yeah. actually have a knock-on effect. And we're talking about North Africa, we're talking about Egypt, we're talking about instability elsewhere as a result of that conflict. I think, I think we need to put efforts collectively, not to send weapons, maybe to send food, to send uh, clothes, to help, but not to send weapons for them to die. Yeah. I'm, I'm against that. Yeah. I'm against that. So, so sending weapons to anyone, any two fights, you don't send them weapons. You try to calm them, you try to incentivize the talk, and hopefully we can see an end to this where the prices of goods uh, are there. We are at the risk of a recession, we are at the risk worldwide. So you're not talking about two countries here, you're talking about the whole world. Yeah. There are poor people who are struggling to survive. And they cannot, today they cannot bring food. Now if everything is going and staying where they are, I think we will have, we will have bigger issues. That's why for us in the UAE, as a country of peace, we are always promoting peace, we're always promoting talk, and we are, I mean, from the energy perspective, we look at it at the same way. I don't think we are doing the wrong thing by incentivizing talk and trying to end it. And if we are asked, uh, if, if the right thing is to send weapons, then I don't think that is right for us. Before I let you go, I want to ask you about China. Because when we think about the energy dynamics, as you said, with the knock-on effect to the entire world, obviously half of the energy supplies, probably more, that China is receiving are coming from this part of the world, from the Middle East, from the Gulf Arab countries, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and others. When you think about what's happening with regard to the United States, the West, and the conversation with Beijing, is it a missed opportunity, in your view, for the UAE, 
and other Gulf Arab countries to be that interlocutor with Beijing, to be the person who goes to them and says, listen, let's have a real conversation about not only supporting the global economy and global economic growth, which lifts us all up, we hope, but also at the same point, talking about everything else, conflict, global growth, all these kinds of things. Is there a role to play for the UAE, for Gulf Arab countries in that conversation? Because it seems to me you're right smack dab in the middle of it. Well, look, in my field, which I, we can, which I can only cover, uh, we are part, partners. China is a partner. China is, is uh, having stake in our oil fields. They are part of our uh, production. They are part of the technology transfer. Uh, we are a, a major supplier to China. China have a, uh, an aspiration in the trade and we have similar aspirations. So China and countries in the East, whether Indonesia and many other countries, they are partners to us and they are logical partners. They are, they are our customers and we have to, to pay attention to what they require, try to benefit from that relationship and uh, and, 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 be, uh, and, and UAE is, is an independent state. It's not going to follow what one country wants. Or, or we have, uh, we are proud of our uh, independence, and we are we are uh, a, a modern state, and we are a sophisticated investor. We have our investments everywhere, so we have all right to be friend with everyone. And what we want to do is be friend with everyone. We're friends with the U.S. or friends with the with the Europeans. But you're not taking a call from President Biden. No, I I I think I think that's what you told me the last time we spoke. No, I, President Biden doesn't call me. I'm I'm uh, uh, I, the the the. the uh, but if the United States were to call you, you'd take the call. I had a meeting today with uh, with some uh, some envoys from the United States. The United States is. But it doesn't necessarily sway no, your opinion no, I, one I, way or another. I don't think I don't think we should take it that way. The United States is a very important partner to us, and we have significant investments. We have much more in common with the United States, and uh, but that doesn't mean that we would have to agree on everything. I mean, we would uh, we would agree on the things that uh, that we think we can uh, we can we can agree, and there are things that we could disagree, uh, and we are not going to be told what to do. We we know uh, where, what is sensible for us. And in the field of energy, I haven't received any call or any request for a call from the Secretary of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, energy. The energy. And uh, Nothing? No, she didn't call me, she didn't approach me. And, uh, huh. and if she wanted to call, she was always going to be welcomed. I would not say no to, uh, to any, I uh, speak with everyone. So I think, I think taking it that way is not, is not the right approach. But if taking a call means that we have to listen to something that is not that is that we cannot do then then that is that is not the uh, that is not how it should be interpreted yeah. us is important it's an important friend we are investing there they are investing here we have lots of collaboration with them and cooperation so it's the largest economy in the world given the problems with the transition and the worries that we have about supply, was the bugabear, if you will, of shale overstated in your view when you think about it with regards to OPEC? And flooding the market to make sure that shale as an industry died it didn't quite happen. But I'm just curious how you feel about it today. Do you think, given the fact that we need a greater supply, means that shale should be reinvested in and that we should see that industry yes, grow. Yes, and we've been... And is necessary. It is. Not yeah. only shale, deep, deep water, shale, all production. And that's what we have been saying. Don't forget that we were the first to go to the independent and shale producers during Sarah Week for years and years. And we spoke... You wore the them. hat, yes. We were there, we spoke to them, they're our friends, and we're still talking. Yeah. And we are incentivizing them, talking-wise, and some of us investing there to increase their production. But they are not getting the support from the governments and from the financial institutions. They're complaining that they're the shareholders 
and some of the uh, of the uh, of the financial institutions are telling them thank you we're not interested to invest in in your acreage anymore so they are not getting the support not only them them the IOCs and others so we need to be realistic we cannot you cannot change your mind you say you are I don't want to invest in oil and after six months you say well more oil more oil more oil that's that is not that is not logical we need now to reassess the situation in my view we need the, the financial institutions to come and say we are ready to finance oil and gas and we need to look at the contracts especially for gas and to consider long-term contracts because short-term contracts and spot market the investors are not going to put the money we have seen a fluctuation on the prices that is scary and uh, that is in a sense going to also uh, incentivize further growth into the renewable energy even though the prices of solar panels and wind is going to go higher because all of the commodities on, and, and uh, the minerals that is in the industry have gone up by 100% or 80% or 60%. So that is also uh, a, a, uh, an area that we need to watch. I keep you here all day, but they're going to kill me. Your Excellency, it's so wonderful to have you on CNBC. Thank you so much for sharing your time.